Okay, so chapter 12 is on solids, but I'd like to start by going over some background about atoms and molecules. Then we'll get into crystal structure and elasticity and go into archers and scaling. So the first thing you need to know is that everything in the world is made of atoms. And they're, in, they're incredibly small. Even a teaspoon of water has over 10 to the power 23 atoms in it. So you can imagine they're much too small to be seen with visible light. And in fact, the first time atoms were directly observed was in 1970 in these images you see of individual thorium atoms connected in, in these chains. So atoms have some internal structure, just so you know. Uh, they're made of a nucleus and some orbiting electrons. And the nucleus, in turn, is made of protons and neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are even made of quarks. But uh, basically, in terms of electric charge, protons have plus one and electrons have negative one. So if an atom has the same number of protons as electrons, then it's electrically neutral. So atoms refer to the particles that make up a substance. And an elemental substance is composed of only one kind of atom. So the lightest and most abundant element in, uh, in the universe is hydrogen. You can see up here there's the Hindenburg, which is filled with hydrogen, it's, and it's very flammable. And to date, there are about 115 elements total known, 90 of which occur in nature, and others of which are produced in the laboratory. And the words atom and element can, can be used interchangeably. So here's the periodic table of the elements. So every uh, entry here is a type of atom. So there's hydrogen, number one, helium's number two, and in all these numbers, atomic numbers refer to the number of protons in the nucleus of this atom. So a lithium atom has three protons in its nucleus. There's beryllium is four, boron is five, carbon, every carbon atom has six protons in its nucleus. And you can see other things here, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, sodium and potassium, uh, I think there's silver and gold are on here, all of these are elements. And compounds are made of molecules. So molecule is when two or more atoms are bonded together. Example, NH3 uh, is one nitrogen and three hydrogens all uh, bound together. That's a molecule of ammonia. And there's even a little cartoon diagram of an ammonia molecule here. To the left of it is an oxygen molecule, two oxygens bonded together. Uh, here is a methane molecule, a carbon with uh, four hydrogens bonded to it. And here's a water molecule, which is H2O. So atoms, if they're arranged in a regular array, are called a crystal. And a crystal has a property that if you shine an x-ray on it, you get this uh, diffraction pattern, which uh, gives you evidence that it is a crystal structure and tells you what kind of structure it is. And there's also solids where the atoms are all connected uh, randomly, and that's called amorphous solids. So whenever you have a crystal, the bonds between uh, neighboring atoms uh, can be ionic, covalent, metallic, or van der Waals. Uh, so ionic bonds means that uh, two neighboring atoms have actually uh, transferred an electron over, so the one atom becomes positive and the other becomes negative. And salts are a good example of ionic bonds, like sodium chloride. Uh, covalent bonds is when uh, two neighboring atoms are sharing a pair of electrons, and the most famous covalent bond is carbon-carbon. So this is a, a picture of a lot of carbons. The, each carbon atom has four outer electrons that it can share around. So the most dense and strongest uh, carbon, pure carbon structure uh, is when each carbon is linked up with four neighboring carbons, and this is actually called diamond. This is a uh, picture of a diamond structure. Uh, metallic bonds is when many, many electrons are free to roam and, uh, and bond uh, the atoms together, and so metals can conduct electricity. And then van der Waals is the weakest force, and the most famous example of van der Waals is when graphite uh, sticks to things. So if you write with a pencil and the graphite gets stuck to the paper, that's called the van der Waals force, which is why you can erase things. But the properties of a solid are depend on what kind of bonds exist between the atoms in the solid. Density. 
So a property of any material is density, which is uh, the mass of any part of it divided by the volume of that part. And any material will have a particular density. So the units can be kilograms per, per meter cubed or grams per centimeter cubed. An example is water has a density of 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. And you can convert that to one gram per centimeter cubed. So if you have a 1,000 cubic centimeters or a thousandth of a cubic meter, that's one liter. So this bottle of Evian water would have a mass of one kilogram. Elasticity. So any solid object, if you subject it to external forces, it might undergo changes in its shape. And an elasticity is a measure of how much it changes per deforming force and, uh, and how it returns to its original shape. So if you bend an eraser, it wants to return to its original shape. And if a material doesn't do that, like clay or something, then that's called inelastic. Hooke's law describes the fact that more force will produce more extension of an object. For example, a spring obeys Hooke's law. And in this animation, it shows a greater and greater force being applied to the spring because you're hanging one, two, three, four, and five masses. And as you increase the force, you increase the extension. So this little uh, tilde means that the force is proportional to the extension. So twice the force means twice the extension. When something is pulled, this is called tension. And an example might be a bungee cord supporting this person. The bungee is under tension. And when something is squashed, it's under compression. So here's an example of a baseball. It's being pushed by this bat so it squishes a little bit. And here is something that's both under tension and compression. A girder is supporting this box. Well, if you draw a dashed line down the middle of the girder and consider the bottom part of it, the bottom part is stretched, but the top part is compressed. And it turns out that solids are usually a lot stronger for compression than they are under uh, tension. And by that, I mean that if this was to break or rip, the, the breaking would happen on the bottom part of the beam first. So roofs of older uh, buildings needed a lot of supporting columns, but uh, arches, when they were discovered, supporting columns were no longer needed. And so all these blocks in an arch take advantage of the fact that stone is very strong under compression. So if an arch is supported only by its own weight, so it's completely in, in, uh, in compression mode, then it forms a shape called a catenary. And if, actually, an upside down catenary is exactly the shape that a chain would have. So this chain is supported entirely by tension, and this St. Louis arch is supported entirely by compression. And if you take this catenary and rotate it around in a circle, you can form uh, a dome. So this dome of Convocation Hall here on campus is, is also supported by compression. Scaling. Scaling is the study of how volume and shape of an object affects its relationship between strength, weight, and surface area. And the basic rule is that strength is proportional to area, which is two-dimensional and measured in square centimeters, and weight is related to volume, which is three-dimensional and is measured in cubic centimeters. So for example, uh, if you look at one sort of sugar cube, it's got a length side of one centimeter and it's filled with water, it would have a mass of one gram. If you double the length, then the area goes up to by a factor of four and the volume goes up by a factor of eight. If you have three times the length, then you have nine times the area and 27 times the volume or the mass. Or four times the length, uh, Again, the area goes up as the square, so it's uh, 16 times the area, and the volume goes up as the cube, so it's 64 times the volume. And so if you look at the surface area to volume ratio, it's the size is squared divided by the volume, which is cube. It's 1 over the size. So this will decrease as the size increases. And since surface area is related to strength and volume is related to weight, 
strength to weight ratio of an object decreases with increasing size. So this fly has a very high strength compared to its weight, which is why it can crawl away to, right up a wall. Whereas this elephant has a very uh, low strength to weight ratio. So you can't imagine an elephant crawling up a wall.